Hello and welcome to the Womb Centered Healing Podcast. I'm Sama Morningstar and I have Isabel with me here today. Thank you so much, Isabel, for joining us on the podcast. I met Isabel through a podcaster's platform where we um, join each other on each other's show. Um, I got to be a guest on Isabel's show. It was lovely. Uh, thank you for having me as a guest. And then we determined that Isabel would like to join us here on the Womb Centered Healing Podcast. So it's so lovely to have you here, Isabel. And we'd love for you, I'd love for you to introduce yourself a little bit more and share about your personal womb centered healing journey. Why, thank you for having me on your podcast, Sama. Uh, and it was a pleasure to have you in mine as well. Um, well, I am a coach. I coach child-free women. So child-free women are women who have decided consciously not to have children or adopt or foster. So basically uh, not raising a child. And that was the reason why you were on my podcast as well, because you've chosen yourself to be child-free, to embrace the child-free lifestyle. Um, so that's what I do. I essentially have coaching programs for women who feel uh, who have feelings of anger or anxiety or shame or even anger uh, that are related to their choice. And at the same time, I also have a podcast that you mentioned. It's called The Honest Uproar, and it features stories from child-free women from around the world. Um, so they come up and tell me a little bit what, uh, why they made the decision to, to embrace the child-free lifestyle. And also they, we talk about their lives and they have we all have such rich and interesting lives, right? So it's the whole point of the podcast is to create or foster a stronger sense of community among child-free women. Now, regarding my womb healing journey, that is quite, it is a, a I've been thinking about this, you know, because I knew we were going to have this conversation. The first thing I remember about my, womb in general was that when I was 12 years old, I was quite developed physically. And my mom took me to a doctor because I hadn't had my first period yet. I was 12, 13 years old. And the doctor was like, well, she's quite developed and she hasn't had her period. So she needs to take some hormones. And so I did. And that was the, my first period was actually forced. Wow. Um, with hormones. So I had to, I took hormones for a little bit just to have my periods. And I remember it was traumatic. And I remember I just, I felt, it, it felt painful as well. Um, I wasn't, I wasn't at all, uh, you know, I, I didn't feel comfortable with having a period. Um, I, I, I stopped taking those pills eventually. It wasn't longer than a year that I took them. And my periods just completely stopped. So, and, and still up until today, I don't get my period every single month. Um, so when I was uh, maybe 15 or 16, I started, you know, having all these exams and they found that I have polycystic ovaries. So I'm, I have PCOS. Um, so that was the reason why you're not menstruating. And they were explaining, you know, that the lining of my ovaries is a little bit thicker than normal. So the uh, when I ovulate, um, those eggs don't get into my uterus and that it was going to be very hard for me to become pregnant one day if I ever decided to do that and that I had to take more hormones. And every time I took hormones, I felt horrible, whether it was birth control pills or the pills that they gave me when I was younger. So I could menstruate, uh, Provera, I think they're called, uh, that was like the, uh, the commercial name. Um, I took, I used the Nuva ring once as well. And that was a horrible experience. I mean, everything that has to do with putting hormones in my body has always been rejected by my body, just essentially completely rejected. Um, so I'm, I could say that um, after a lot of uh, speaking and soul searching, speaking with my therapist, I mean, about what the role of a woman is, right? Because, and this is something that we spoke about in our in, in the interview that we did in my podcast, I had this idea that the only people who had wombs were, were female, right? Female born, and you were explaining to me that uh, biologically speaking, we're all female in the womb, and then the Y, uh, um, 
the Y chromosome then, then turns that womb into a different organ in male, male bodies. Well, um, there's so anyway, more than two, there's more than two genders that happen biologically, by the way. So yeah. uh, there are quite a variety of gendered bio biological variations besides the typical male female duality that mm -hmm. we're that we think is the are the only two options they're not the only two options just to clarify <laughs> i would probably just yeah. but that's but that's easy to forget because our whole society is based on this you know uh binary gendered um yeah. belief system which isn't actually biologically true but anyway that's a side note so what you're saying <laughs> but you did mention that uh -huh. but before i didn't know anybody i didn't know anything about this I, I didn't actually when i was younger i had absolutely no interest in exploring what the biology bi you know the biology of human beings in general I've, I've never been too keen into that that part of of science um i remember thinking that women had a really hard time in the world women as in people that had a uterus, right? And that being a man or being male was a lot easier. They had easier lives, it was easier for them. So in a way, um, I think I was kind of like rejecting that femininity, that part of me that made me a woman, um, you know, and so to speak. And it's been quite a struggle. Uh, I had, like I mentioned, I still don't have my periods, even though my uterus is intact. Um, I get them sometimes. Some I can go six months without periods, and then I can go six months with you know my periods. And maybe they have they come once a month, or maybe they come twice per month. I know that I don't want to take hormones, so I've just let my womb be. You know, I try to reconcile myself with the fact that I'm not going to have periods every month. Uh, Fortunately, like I mentioned, I don't want to have children. I'm child free. So there's no need for me to try to regulate my womb in a way so that I can actually foster life in that sense. Um, but I know that it's very important for me to make peace with my womb because that's also the creative part, like my creativity and everything. I feel it comes from there as well. So that's in a nutshell what I have been um going through with my womb. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to discuss a, a few things um, that this your situation brings up because I'm sure, and in fact, I know for a fact that you're not the only one who has had these types of experiences. Um, and there's aspects of it that the doctor doesn't tell you about or even know about. There's aspects of the womb that are completely, and, and your health, your overall health as a biological human being that has a uterus, okay? Um, there's aspects of your overall health that the, our modern Western doctors are completely ignorant of. In fact, Female bodied, womb bearing bodies were have been deliberately excluded from medical research until the 1990s. Because the menstrual cycle and having a womb it is such an integrated, integral part of our overall biology, inextricable completely integrated, affecting all systems, all the other systems in our body are affected by and have an effect on the menstrual cycle and the womb and all the functions of, of the womb. And so all of the medical research, the, the, the animals that were being used to, to experiment with on procedures and drugs, with procedures and drugs, they had, it didn't work the same with female bodies as it does with male bodies. And so in order to simplify their research, they just did the research on male bodies and then said, but we can still give those drugs and do those procedures on the female body. Even though the whole reason they're excluding them is because it has different, completely different effects and different complications and different things happen when you do the same thing 
on a female body as you do on a male body. So, so this is the tradition that we're talking about when you say I went to the doctor to talk about my menstrual cycle. And then once there was research being done, the research that was being done on female bodies was being done uh, like the, the founder of modern day Western gynecology was doing unanesthetized surgical research on enslaved African women for years and years and years before ever, um, before, you know, presenting these procedures for, um, in a medical school. Then he created a medical school to train others how to do these procedures. So this is the foundation of the medical gynecological information that's available in Western medicine right now. Yeah. Yikes. Yikes is right. When you start to look at who you're going to for information about this, right? So the in in the Western med medical model, the people that were the keepers of healthy female bodied wisdom were vilified and excluded. So the midwives and the herbalists who helped uh, people with wombs to have a healthy body, be able to bear children and be able to have a healthy lifestyle were the herbalists and the midwives. And they have been vilified and persecuted and burnt at the stake for thousands of years by the people who were trying to put forth this uh, masculine dominated medical system. So that, that's who you're going to, even if it can be a female gynecologist who has all the best intentions in the world, but all of their studies, everything that they studied in school is based on that foundation. Now, there are uh, older medical traditions from different parts of the world that still have uh, traditions intact that take into consideration the female body, the womb, the uterus being an integrated system in the body and the importance of the menstrual cycle as a vital sign that tells you not just about your fertility, not just about whether or not you can have children, but the overall health of your entire body. And it tells you tons of information about your overall health. So that it's not just about fixing your womb so you can have a baby. It's about listening to the messages that your womb is telling you about your overall health in order pre to prevent long-term detrimental health conditions over the course of your life, which is a completely different thing. Yeah. Okay. And so the doctors that are saying, oh, we'll just put you on hormones. First of all, there is absolutely no good research or testing or diagnostics that are going on there. Those doctors that are doing that are doing that based on propaganda from the drug companies to sell their drugs. Now, there are some fun, uh, functional medicine doctors and naturopathic doctors that, ha that are starting to compile the research that has been done about hormones and how they actually affect the body and actually do adequate testing. Like my question would be, when that first doctor told you you needed hormones, did they actually test your hormone levels first? Probably not. I don't recall. Has anyone ever, have anyone who ever prescribed hormones or birth control pills to you ever tested your hormone levels? Yes. And you know, the, the thing is, they actually came out normal. They, they came were out all normal, but they still recommended hormones to you. Yes. Mm -hmm. So that's the thing is that even with this diagnosis, everybody's just blind and saying, oh, you just need hormones. Oh, you just need hormones because those hormone drug companies give them a perk, a bonus every time they sell you some hormones. 
So uh, with, you know, profit oriented, uh, and maybe where you live, it's not as profit oriented as it, as it is here in the United States. So I can't speak globally about that, but um, that is definitely a lot of the time what's going on here in the United States, unfortunately. And so what I talk about with my clients and, and students is if you really want to understand what's going on with your womb and start to look at your womb as a vital sign and your menstrual cycle as a vital sign, just as important, if not more so, than your heart rate, your body weight, your body temperature, all those other things that the doctor tests and, and, and determines if some things if things are okay with you or perhaps potentially not okay with you, right? Like your blood tests, all those vital signs of how healthy you are overall. Your menstrual cycle has tons of information to tell you about that. So the, for example, the polycystic ovarian sy syndrome. First of all, not starting your period yet, even though you're fully developed at age 12 or 13, is perfectly normal and healthy. Yeah, they didn't tell me that. <laughs> yeah, start your period at a variety of different times, at variety of different developmental levels, as far as you know, when their breasts are developed or when the rest of their body, body hairs come in, or that's a mysterious rhythm for every individual. And, and without testing you for, you know, without you having any difficult symptoms or anything, giving you those hormones at that early developmental age, jumpstarting your system before it was ready is probably the cause of why you've had trouble the whole rest of your life. Yeah, I thought about it too. And, and those artificial hormones, uh, which is often given, unfortunately, to young women before, you know, as they're in that developmental phase, um, completely disrupts our body's natural production of hormones. And it's just getting started, it's just getting developed. And then you're giving it this artificial thing that just completely, you know, gets it out of whack. When the actual fact of the matter is, even if there were some kind of problem delaying your development of your menstrual cycle at that age, giving it an artificial jumpstart is the last thing you'd want to do to help it get going. What you'd first want to do is make sure you're having proper nutrition so that your body has the raw materials to make its own hormones. You'd want to look at stress factors of how, for example, how you feel about menstruation and the emotional aspects of growing up, noticing how hard all women have it, have it in, their, in their lives and whether or not you even want to be a woman in the first place. Right? None of the doctors are addressing that. <laughs> right? None of them. No. <laughs> Which is huge because we, you know, the way we think and feel deeply influences our biology. And so, you know, that is a very common thing for young women to be terrified of starting their period, terrified of becoming a woman because they've seen how much their mothers have suffered. And they don't want that. Yeah. For themselves. Of course not. And so we can, in that state of fear and stress, our systems and our whole systems in our body just shut down. If it's not safe to blossom into our full fertility and creativity and all of that, because we're not going to be taken care of in that vulnerability of opening up, we're not going to do it. So there's a, there's a so great wisdom in that. It's self-preservation of the body. Exactly. Exactly. It takes a lot of energy. It takes a lot of resources to fully develop into a fully fertile and healthy woman. Well, our society and our belief systems do not support that fully healthy, thriving women. 
in fact, au contraire. So it all makes sense, even though, you know, there, there likely wasn't that big of a problem going on, except perhaps some nervousness about becoming a woman. That if you'd had the right support around that, which maybe it was available and maybe not, obviously not, right? <laughs> but if, if possibly if it was available and you had an aunt or someone who could you could have talked to, who could have shown you the beautiful things about being a woman and encouraged you and helped you to relax a little bit that you know your, your body could have developed on its own, but you didn't have that. Yeah, I often think about that too, because yeah. there's so much that, like you said, you know, that in our surroundings and, and how we grow and uh, how we were brought up that shapes our biology, mm -hmm. right? Um, and I often think about what would have happened if instead of taking me to a gynecologist who, you know, made me that, well, told me that I had needed to take hormones, I would have been taken to, uh, I don't know, a therapist or somebody who supports young women who are actually going through this change, right? And it's so important uh, because it is, the, there's a rite of passage as mm -hmm. well. You know, you, 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 the, first, the first time you menstruate, you become a woman, right? Yeah. So, and, and I think that's very, that's quite embedded in my culture. Um, I'm Colombian, so Latin American people are, you know, it's, it's a whole rite of passage, you know, she, she stops being a child and now she's a woman and yeah. And so what are some of the typical um, rites of passage that are present in your culture for supporting young women besides taking them to the gynecology to gynecologists to get hormones if they're late? <laughs> <laughs> uh, to be honest, uh, the rites of passage are more like celebrations of milestones. So one of them is, you know, getting your period, which normally is between the ages of, of 12 and 14. Well, that's what they think. I know, I know women who have had their first period way later in life uh, because they just let it be, right? Right. Um, there's also the rite of passage when you turn 15. So the quinceañeras, that's, so, that's mm -hmm. really important in the whole Latin American culture as well. Um, it's, it's more or less like the sweet 16 in the States. So it's comparable mm -hmm. in that sense. Uh, those are like the two main ones, I would say. There, there isn't any, any other that I can think of um, specifically for women. And they're not very like, let's support you in this time. They're more like, let's celebrate that you're, you know, uh, coming into your own womanhood or you're turning 15 and that's so important. But uh, you know, the whole support of what's going through your mind. Are you doing okay? Especially when one is a teenager, right? So because normally you get your period when you're a teenager, when you're in your teens, and then 15, you're also, you're, you know, smack in the middle of your teenage years. And the hormones are just like doing their thing, right? They're trying to reorganize and like giving you all the necessary push for you to grow and to, you know, become an adult eventually. And, and that affects people in general, but women specifically, uh, it affects our moods, it affects our mental state, it, it affects so much about our personality as well. I was a terrible teenager, I was horrible. Um, I know I, I put my parents through I, my parents through a lot when I was a teen, but I never got, I don't think I actually got that sense of um, there is the support system. I mean, my parents tried, of course, they took me to see a, a, a psychologist and they were mostly open, like more, 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 more often than not, they were open to having conversations with me, right? But still, I, I think that there should be a lot more support in society in general for, for women during that period of time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, I think that the celebrations like the quinceanera, how do you say quinceanero? Quinceanera. 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 <laughs> yes. Um, I think that's reminiscent of uh, indigenous practices of celebrating menarche or first menstruation. Um, and 
and yet it's not really expressed in that way. It's, you know, with the whole Catholic influence, um, there you're wearing a white dress, right? <laughs> or a, pastel, <laughs> a, pastel a bit of dress. <laughs> yeah, pastels, usually very puffy dresses. Yes. Puffy dresses, <laughs> right. Um, there's no like acknowledgement of first blood. There's no speaking of that. It's that all that part is behind the scenes. If anyone really talks to you at all or supports you around that. Whereas indigenous cultures where that, where that is intact, where it's very clear and out in the open, what's actually being celebrated, that menstruation is included in the celebration those indigenous practices, it's very interesting to study what's going on in those cultures when that uh, is actually still intact and in place. And one of the interesting things that I've learned about that is uh, there was a research project that showed that cultures that celebrate mens first menstruation, menarche in young women and young um, womb bearers, they are more peaceful than culture, wow. than culture less warlike so they're celebrating the blood of life and therefore not having to celebrate the blood of death through war wow yeah that's, that's very interesting i didn't know that um i find that very interesting and i mean yes you're right i mean we do have a lot of celebrations that are uh you know it's it's their heritage from the indigenous people who used to live in this land. But of course, after we were colonized, the religion, especially Catholic religion in our countries just completely took over everything and made it about God and religion and whatnot. Uh, I don't, I mean, quinceañeras is not a particularly religious celebration, but it definitely does not have anything to do with menarche at all. But it does in the time of life that it oh lasts. yeah it does secretly secretly oh, okay. to do with with menarche but the secretiveness of it is what sort of strips it of the power of the more ancient intact practices of celebrating yeah. deliberately and overtly um, yeah menarche. and so I often talk about how celebrating menarche even retroactively. And this is one of the healing practices that I teach uh, people in my programs is to give yourself a retroactive menarche celebration. And we do a whole in my program, we do a whole preparation for that, where you're really releasing some of the belief systems and fears and giving yourself the support you might have liked to have received from a beneficent auntie or something that wasn't there for you giving yourself you know gathering the wisdom that you've scraped from underneath rocks and behind leaves and things like that over the course of your life you've managed to scrape <laughs> some wisdom together and now you get to be your own beneficent auntie and go back you know mad in your imagination visit yourself back in time and give yourself the support that you might have liked and have a lovely uh, celebration with yourself about your menarche. And so this is one of the healing practices. And what I talk about is that this is one of the most revolutionary things we can do and the most powerful practices that we can do to restore harmonious and peaceful humanity. Yeah, it sounds, it sounds interesting. I don't think I've ever heard that uh, type of practice. I mean, heard of that type of practice before. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I'm wondering, for example, in my specific case, since my menarche was violently pushed out of me, <laughs> mm -hmm. when, like, where should I go back? Like to that moment or when I actually stopped taking the hormones and it just happened for me? Well, I think that would be something that you could consult with your own inner womb wisdom. Hmm. And that's another thing that I teach in my programs is how to start listening to this source of a huge source of wisdom that we have in our womb space. So there's more brain matter in our bellies than there is in our head. 
And we're taught to only pay attention to this 5% of our brain in our frontal lobes. 5% of the entire brain matter in our brain itself, in our head, is what we're supposed to limit ourselves to as what can help us with any problems or figuring things out or what we should listen to and be have, you know, treat as valuable information it comes from this 5% of our logical thinking brain. And we've been taught that anything that comes from uh, the, the rest of our brain and the rest of our body, meaning dream information, intuitive information, um, clairvoyance, clairsentience, clairaudience, all of that is invalid, unreliable, dangerous. Our emotional wisdom, dangerous, doesn't exist, not real. The only thing we're supposed to pay attention to is this 5%. How limiting is that? We've Very. got this mothership of intelligence in the whole rest of our brain and in our whole body, more of it available in our belly than is even in our physical head. <clears throat> wow. And there's a direct line of communication between the womb and the brain. Whew, right there, immediate. And so all we need to do is practice womb listening. So there's ways that we can breathe. And I, this is one of my initial offerings. When people sign up for my mailing list, they get a womb listening meditation audio mp3 where you learn how to breathe and connect with your womb wisdom and listen to that wisdom and what most people discover is that that's a voice that they're very familiar with but that they're not necessarily used to listening to 100 percent of the time because so much of society is telling them it's not valid that doesn't mean anything you should be using a different you should be thinking about things in a different way Right. Yep. And so reclaiming that intrinsic wisdom and authority with ourselves and learning to trust that. And that might be a process of testing it out of saying, OK, I'm getting this answer. I'm not sure if I trust that answer. Let me go experiment and see if I try what, doing what that says, what happens. And if I try doing what my logical thinking mind says, what happens? And you try it out and you compare the two and say, well, actually, it kind of worked out great for me to listen to my womb wisdom. And that's usually what happens is that, and then you start to trust it the more you start listening and following that guidance and what a relief most people share about gosh I you know if I had just listened to that back then this would have happened differently and you know and and you start to piece it together that gosh I knew that all along yeah <laughs> I, just, I know exactly what you mean <laughs> yeah and so most people do and and then they're like you mean I have permission to listen to what I knew all along and what I could see in hindsight if I had just listened to that you know, and so that's, that's womb listening. The, one of the fundamental practices, getting in touch with our inner guidance, our womb guidance. And our womb guidance motivation is for our optimum health and well-being and integrated holistic optimum health and well-being. And our yeah. healthiest relationships and for the optimum health of all of humanity and all living beings and of life in general. That's the motivation of our womb wisdom. Whereas our logical thinking brain might have all kinds of twisted motivations that doesn't benefit everyone or even ourselves. <laughs> because it's, that disconnected, disembodied, you know, uh, part of our brain is, is disconnected from from life oftentimes because that's what we're trained we were trained to do is to disconnect with how we feel disconnect with our emotions disconnect with the world learn to exploit and you know do all this other stuff and uh it's not working out so well for us as a species doing it that way no no <laughs> absolutely not 
It's true. I feel that there's just so much of that uh, ancient wisdom that we need to listen back to. And, and something that you said to me during our interview, my podcast that I found really interesting was that the cycle of the womb is, is the way that people should like model their lives around, you know, that cycle of, um, you know, the, and the 28 day cycle, I guess it would be right. Well, so, there's definitely some healthy variation in that. Um, especially with all the artificial lighting that we have with electricity now. Uh, I think when we didn't have artificial light and the, the main light at night was the moon, then it was much more common for wombs to be on a 28 to 29 to 30 day cycle, which is about the same kind of variation that the lunar cycle is on. Yeah. And so that the light from the moon very much is part of that regulatory thing. So one of the most natural ways to um, connect with the menstrual cycle is to connect with moonlight and moon bathing. Does that happen only on full moon or at any point? All the, all the phases of the moon. So, you know, there's 28 days in the moon cycle. Yeah. And there's a different quality of light and a different amount of moonlight on each one of those nights and days. And I think each one of those has an effect. And, you know, the other thing is to look at our overall health and look at our menstrual cycle and how it is. Uh, you know, the thing that you talked about with the polycystic ovaries, having the, you know, what they described to you about the, the, the sac that, that each egg is developing within being extra thick. And if you talk, if you think about the, the fear that you had about becoming a woman and, and that your body, that you embodied at a young age of saying, no, I don't want that to happen. That it makes perfect sense that your body would try to stop that ovulation from happening. And one yeah. way to do that is to grow a thick skin over it so that the egg can't develop properly. Mm -hmm. so when they were looking at your hormones and said your hormones are normal, but they still had the only hormones to respond to your condition with, it just shows how limited that medical approach to it is. Whereas a midwife or an herbalist like myself, I'm an herbalist, not a midwife, but I'm an herbalist, I would say, oh, well, let's see if there are herbs that can help and, and herbal practices, like for example, vaginal steaming, that can help to soften the tissues. And not only that, but give you a feeling of pleasure and relaxation and taking care of yourself as a woman and celebrating yourself as a woman that will address not only the physical and physiological aspects of this imbalance, but also the emotional and spiritual aspects. It will give you time for self-reflection and to really nurture yourself, your body, your female body, your womb space, and take time to, to listen to that inner wisdom about it. Not because you want to have kids, you know you don't want to have kids, but because you want to have the healthiest body to do all the things that you're going to do in your life, not having kids, other things. There's plenty of other things that you still need a healthy body. Yeah. Right? <laughs> exactly. As somebody who's not having children myself, it's not because I'm just going to sit around and not do anything. It's yep. <laughs> I want to do and I want to have a healthy body to do that and so and my womb if it's not healthy that means there's other parts of me that aren't healthy either so that that hardening up of the tissue around 
the ovary, there's probably other tissues in the body that are hardening up and preventing, uh, you know, other things from, from flowing freely. Could be. And Could be. Yeah. that free flow, uh, you know, because when those um, eggs develop and that, that pouch would normally open up, it releases other hormones. It releases certain hormones into your body. And those hormones that produce the egg, release the egg, and then the hormones that happen when you're um, menstruating and all of that, they have effects on all the other organs on your in your body that are healthy and vice versa. And so, um, you know, having a healthy menstrual cycle is in certain medical models like herbalism, midwifery, Chinese medicine, and Ayurvedic medicine, which are thousands and thousands of years older, more tried and true than Western medicine that was based on excluding women from research or exploiting and abusing women for the research. Right. So these ancient systems that may have some of that in there because they were they were their patriarchal societies as well, but they have they didn't completely eradicate the systems that were built on recognizing and celebrating the the womb as a vital organ and as a, an important part of our health. So you go to an Ayurvedic doctor or a a Chinese medicine doctor, or herbalist, or a midwife, and they're really going to listen to all the details, ask you more questions about your menstrual cycle, and work with helping your menstrual cycle to be healthy so that as part of your overall health, because it's not seen as some separate thing that can be over here all not happy, and you can still be perfectly healthy over here. Yeah, it's more of a holistic approach to exactly. your body. Yeah. Exactly. Which I think is one of the things that is lacking in modern medicine. Like, oh, we yeah. kind of like just go to the specific thing and then try to find the root of that specific thing, but they don't look at the, at the body as a whole. I mean, that's yeah. why there are so many specialists as well. <laughs> um, well it's, the, it's the mechanical model. So there's three models that... that um, there's three mo three approaches that I like to talk about in in a, a healing approach. Okay, so the first one is the mechanical model, which is Western modern medicine, which looks at the body like a machine with all these parts and pieces and fluids. That if something's not work working, you can you can surgically mechanically alter it and force it to work again, or add a substance or take away a substance and you know take things apart and put things back together like you would fixing a car, which completely um, denies the fact that the body has its own intrinsic repair and healing processes that are going on, unlike a machine. Although now with all these smart machines, they can sort of sometimes fix themselves. <laughs> Or at least tell you what's wrong with them, right? <laughs> but yeah. I, I'm a sci-fi geek, so you know, in the future, supposedly the machines will be fixing themselves with self-diagnostics and all this kind of stuff, right? <laughs> so, um, but but still, that mechanical model is like, oh, you should be able to take it apart, put it back together, all this. That's that's the modern medicine approach, but it completely ignores these other parts like, okay, psychology, spirituality, emotions. You know, my, my brother um, studied cognitive psychology and his PhD project was all about finding, you know, isolating which um, chemicals in the brain had which emotional effects on people. This is a big topic because if they can isolate which chemicals have which emotional effects, 
then they can control people's emotions by, you know, mechanically altering this chemical or that chemical, adding some of this, taking away some of that, right? And he and his colleagues thought they found it. They thought they isolated some chemical that, you know, they could, and his colleagues were getting ready to go forward and say, we found it. And my brother was just really strict with his scientific method and found a loophole that they were overlooking. And the whole thing came down like a house of cards. Yeah. They couldn't find it. And so his, his PhD, he got his PhD by saying, this was our theory and we didn't prove it. It was wrong. Whereas a lot of scientists will say, will insist that they proved it just to be successful, right? But that's not the true scientific method. And his colleagues were really pissed at him because they wanted to be the ones <laughs> to crack the chemical emotional code, you know? <laughs> My brother, yeah. No, it's not true. You can't, there's this loophole hole here, you know? It, we can't claim that this is true and be really true about it. So they can't, they, and he worked for many, many years on this and he wasn't the only one. It was on, you know, many, many years of many, many scientists trying to crack the emotional chemical code and they can't do it. So there's all this mystery that the mechanical model does not account for. Yeah. So, so then you have the heroic model, which you see a lot of holistic not not a lot of holistic some holistic health practitioners have the heroic model that says um that there's something dirty in the body that there's all these toxins that we have to cleanse the body so that's when you start to see people saying you need to do this cleanse doing a lot of fasting doing a lot of um you know, intense cleansing and all of that, which can be beneficial from, you know, sometimes, but it can also be overdone. And that, and so it's like, you're, you're doing major things to, to alter the, or to enhance the self-healing functions of the body. And it, it can be very extreme. So a lot of like really extreme dietary changes and things like that are in the heroic model. You want to get an intense, fast, uh, effect by these heroic measures. So that's the second approach. And then you have the wise one way, which is the third approach or the wise woman way. And that way is saying that the body has its own intrinsic wholeness and process and timing and pacing for wellness. And that all we need to do is nourish those natural systems that already exist. The body has its own cleansing system. We just want to make sure it's well nourished and that we're not continually piling in more toxic, more, you know, toxic foods and things like that. We want to remove, probably remove some of the, the toxic influences and just give the body the proper nourishment that it needs and give it the space and time to heal itself. And that's the approach that I that I'm into the most, because that's what creates the most sustained, long term, sustainable healing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I spent 11 years doing fasting and raw food diet and all that, and that actually becomes quite depleting after a while and causes additional problems. Yeah. So anyway, yeah. those are the three approaches and um, you'll notice that Ayurvedic, some Ayurvedic and some Chinese medicine practitioners have that, let's nourish the body's natural healing um, process. Some of them have some of the more heroic and mechanical approaches as well, but anyway. Boy, I could go on and on about all this, <laughs> but <laughs> it's probably about time for us to wrap up. Um, and I'm sure that other listeners here on the podcast who have chosen not to have children might like to listen to your podcast, um, especially uh, the episode where I'm on there, but I'm sure you've interest, uh, interviewed quite a few other very interesting child-free people 
Um, so can you let us know how we can find your podcast? Sure. The, the name of the podcast is The Honest Uproar, and you can find it on every major podcasting platform, including Apple Podcasts. So the it's honest, easy. The Honest Uproar. Yeah, right? correct. Wonderful. It was lovely uh, to be on there with you. It's lovely to have you on here today. Um, and I hope that I answered some of your questions. And I would love to um, share with you more. If you have any other questions, don't hesitate to reach out to me. And that goes for listeners as well. If any of these things that we've discussed today, uh, you can uh, connect with me at wombcenteredhealing.com and sign up for the newsletter there, if you, especially if you wanna get that free womb listening meditation and also be keep up to date with the latest podcast episodes and other offerings and courses and things that are happening there. All right, thanks so much for joining me, for joining us. And um, that's all for now, until next okay. time. Thank you, Sama. You're welcome.